Good evening, my name is Faith and I'm a house manager at Town Hall. On behalf of the staff at Town Hall Seattle and our partners at Institute for Systems Biology, it's my pleasure to welcome you to our presentation with Dr. Jack Gilbert and Dr. Sean Gibbons. As we get underway, I would like to acknowledge our institution stands on the unceded, oh sorry about that, on the unceded traditional territory of the Coast Salish people, particularly the Duwamish. We thank them for our continuing use of the natural resources of their ancestral homeland. We're so glad to have you join us tonight. The presentation will run about 60 minutes, including Q&A. To submit your questions for the Q&A portion of the event, please enter meet.ps forward slash Gilbert or scan the QR code right now on the screen with your smartphone. We'll drop this link in the chat and remind folks where to go when we get to Q&A. We can't, we can't guarantee that we'll get to every question, but we will try to get to as many as possible. You can help us by keeping your own question concise. For those who would like to view the program with closed captions, click the CC button in the bottom right corner of the video player. Town Hall's work is made possible through your support and the support of our sponsors. As part of our RNG Motulski Science Lecture Series, this event is supported by Microsoft. Town Hall is also a member-supported organization, so I'd like to thank all of our members who are joining us. If you share in Town Hall's goal of a community energized and empowered by considering questions of politics, science, and culture, please consider supporting us by becoming a member. You'll find membership information on our website. Dr. Jack A. Gilbert is a professor of microbial oceanography in the Center for Marine Biotechnology and Biomedicine at Scripps Institute of Oceanography and holds a joint appointment in the Department of Pediatrics in UCSD School of Medicine. Dr. Gilbert is also co-founder of the Earth Mic Microbiome Project and American Gut Project, has authored more than 350 peer-reviewed publications and book chapters on microbial ecology, and is the founding editor-in-chief of M Systems Journal. He has been recognized on Crane's Business Chicago's 40 Under 40 list, listed as one of the 50 most influential scientists by Business Insider, and was named as one of the brilliant 10 by Popular Scientist. He is the co-author of Dirt is Good, a popular science guide to the microbiome and children's health. Dr. Sean Gibbons is assistant professor at ISB. He holds a PhD in, bio, in biophysical sciences from the University of Chicago. His graduate work focused on using my, microbial communities as empirical models for testing ecology, e ecological theory. Gibbons completed his postdoctoral training in, Aaron, in Eric Elm's laboratory in the Department of Biological Engineering at MIT, where his work focused on developing techniques to quantify individual-specific eco-evolutionary -evolu dynamics within the human gut microbiome. He is particularly interested in learning how organisms in the human gut change and adapt to individual people over their lifespans and how those changes impact health. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Jack Gilbert and Dr. Sean Gibbons. Thank you, Faith. Uh, and uh, I am I'm very excited tonight. Um, like, like they said, uh, my name is Sean Gibbons uh, here at the Institute for Systems Biology. I'll give you a little bit of background on, on ISB uh, before we jump into it. So, so ISB was started in 2000 by genomics pioneer, Dr. Lee Hood. Uh, we're a nonprofit biomedical research institute located in Seattle's South Lake Union neighborhood. And we work on some of the most pressing issues in health, uh, including the microbiome, aging, COVID-19, brain health, cancer, and, and much more. Uh, there are two ways you can learn more about ISB. Uh, you can visit our website, um, isbscience.org, all one word, as you can see over here. Um, and uh, this next week, actually, we have our, our annual Reimagine event coming up. Uh, and this year is an exciting year. Um, we have this conversation scheduled between Dr. Jim Heath, our, our president, and Nobel laureate Dr. David Baltimore, and an immunology expert, Dr. Mark Davis, and they'll be discussing um, you know, the immune system, and in particular, in light of this, this pandemic we've just been living through, um, and, and the sort of research emerging from that. So you can, again, register for that event if you'd like at isbscience.org. And I'd like to express our thanks to our partner, uh, Town Hall Seattle. For the past decade, ISB and Town Hall have been putting on a number of great science-focused events, and um, we look forward to putting on many more. Uh, and again, if you have questions for, for Jack, um, please add them in, in the chat. Okay, 
I am really, really excited to, uh, to introduce Dr. Jack Gilbert. Um, I won't go through all the things that were said by Faith. She, she gave a pretty great intro of all his accolades. Um, I would say Jack is a microbial ecologist by training. Uh, his lab uses molecular techniques to study microbial communities and how they behave and function. Um, we go way back. Um, I was advised by Jack. Uh, he was my PhD advisor along with Maureen Coleman when I was at the University of Chicago. Um, he's been at the forefront of microbiome research for years uh, and, a, and a real champion of science communication, I would say. I learned everything I know uh, along those lines from him. Um, and that's why I wanted to chat with him today about the current state of the human microbiome field. Uh, where did it start? Where is it now? And, and where is it going? Um, let's see. A one, let's see. One last thing. Da, 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 it's a pleasure. Da, da, da. I, think, I think I said everything I need to say. Uh, welcome, Jack. It's great to have you here. Thanks, Sean. Yeah, you're actually my first graduate student in the United States, which is, yes, uh, which is yeah. I know, right? <laughs> it went all right. It went all right. You, you, you turned out good. Yeah, yeah, you did a good job. Yeah. I, <laughs> I, don't know. I did nothing. I just uh, gave you some like uh, pointing guidelines, I think, and you did it all yourself. It oh, awesome. I remember you showing up at U Chicago and just being this, you know, force of charisma and uh, I'm very inspired to to join up with you and, and, and work on, on a bunch of cool projects. Yeah, so I guess, yeah, let's let's jump into some some questions. I have some sort of strange questions for you at the onset before we jump too far into microbiomes. Um, so I have a bit of a passion uh, for the confluence of art and science. You know, I come from like a background of artists myself. Um, I know that you uh, are a musician and I think you had a band when you were younger. Um, yeah, man. when I was older as well. <laughs> <laughs> you still play, right? Yeah. yeah. So, uh, you know, thinking about that, how do you how do you see that having informed you as a scientist? And do you think there's value in, in, in having art in your life from the perspective of a more quantitative scientific person? Uh, man, yeah, I'm married to an artist. So, uh, yeah, I definitely think it's important. Right. Um, uh, you know, and I love your dad's poetry, by the way. Your dad's a phenomenal poet. I think he's absolutely splendid. If you, if you, anyone out there is interested, you should look up Mark Gibbons. He does incredible poetry. Um, yeah, I mean, art to me is is uh, the same side of the coin to science, right? They're they're both highly imaginative fields that require dedication, training, uh, experience, and you know, a, a, a desire to practice continuously. You know. Uh, I, I've uh, not really. My parents weren't particularly musical, but my my kids are both musical, and my wife and I play music every day. And I think practicing music is one of those things where the more you do it, the easier it becomes. The uh, the more uh, you find out about it, the more you get involved with it. Um, and science is the same way, right? And it's quite remarkable how many scientists, especially. Um, especially in academia, but also in industry, and I've worked in both those fields, are, are musicians, right? You know, uh, or painters or, um, or poets or, you know, some other form of self-expression. And I think, you know, self-expression is absolutely central to being human. <laughs> so art is just another side of humanity. Um, but uh, as you say, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's a phenomenal opportunity to explore who you are and, and what you can be. And uh, I, I feel that science should be the same. And I think they're intrinsically linked. Yeah, no, I, I, I agree with you that I think, I think the best scientists tend to also have some sort of artistic expression in their lives. Although I would say the culture of science doesn't necessarily support that, right? I mean, I, I don't know, I wouldn't say that's the truth of the vast majority of people practicing science of, of having a sort of artistic uh, hobby. Um, yeah. And even I, I, I think a little bit, right? Yeah, side. I think especially in America, right, there's a there's, um, a, a significant push towards, you know, working as hard as you phenomenally can, never taking a holiday and never always being available. And that doesn't really leave a lot of time for you. Uh, you know, I, I've always tried to I, I, I think everybody thinks I work extraordinarily hard, but I, I think I like to think I work smart because I always try and carve out time uh, for my own mental health. Um, for my own sanity to to do things that give me pleasure right and we in my lab we have a code of conduct um, that everybody has to read and uh, you know and evolves over time people add to it but there's a certain degree of adherence that explains that you know everybody is 
who they are and who they can be and want to be. And, and we should respect that, right? And, and give people the space to be human yeah. as well as to contribute to wonderful science. And I think those two things aren't mutually exclusive. There is an opportunity to, to redefine the work ethic that we have to free up time for those personal pursuits which give you pleasure, right? And give yourself the, the breathing space to also be human. Which is, uh, which is, especially you know, as an early career scientist in in your field, you must feel that pressure in academia, especially in, um, I don't know what it's like up in ISB, but it, universities generally, you know, we put so much pressure on people to, to perform and to be, you know, on all the time. It's it's uh, it's brutal, and then we question why there's you know severe mental health crisis in academia. Um, it, something needs to change. It needs to change now. And um, I'm, I'm trying to do what I can in, in my space, but there needs to be a, a revolution. Yeah. Yeah. No, I think we need to take the time to be human, <laughs> like you say. Yeah. Um, all right. So moving into your, your kind of career and, and how you got into what you're doing now, um, as far as I remember, you started off chasing butterflies early yeah. on. Uh, so I guess you were an ecologist at heart. Always, but uh, what uh, what transitioned you into microbes? I'm 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 a, a magpie or a jackdaw. You know, I just uh, I just see shiny things and, and keep on going for them. Yeah. So the uh, I was it, I, I, the first time I saw a microbiology um, anything was a textbook that I got that was delivered to my house um, in my first year of university, which was quite remarkable because I nearly failed high school. The equivalent of high school in the UK, my A levels, um, and and so you know I, I basically scraped my way into um, what at the time was free university education in, in the United Kingdom. That was subsequently scrapped. Now people have to pay for it, but um, and managed to uh, find a space that I felt comfortable in that that I felt that I could uh, apply myself to, and, and that was that was remarkable for me. Uh, I felt uh, super excited about it and. Um, I was never that good at exams, but what I really was good at was, um, I found, was was uh, working on a problem and being tenacious at it, right? And trying to find it out because I found that I was passionate about just nitpicking and, and digging away at problems until we came up with solutions. And so I started working at the Natural History Museum in my second year. Um, and there's only three years and a degree in the UK at that time. And um, I managed to get hooked into trying to figure out how to model butterfly distributions. I mean, of all things, you know, I had no idea what I was doing. I still don't. And, uh, and that, that because it kind of spiraled out of control. I, I remember I was in a, um, a, a lunch break after, after sitting and down and cataloging what must be my 15,000th butterfly uh, from a, the 19th century collections in, in this dusty old room. And, and sitting down, just grabbing a bite to eat outside. And, uh, and somebody gave me a, a, a call my phone and, uh, and offered me a PhD, but I had to go and learn microbiology and work in Antarctica for two years. And I was like, well, I, sure, that sounds like fun. Let's do that, you know? Uh, and uh, that's pretty much been my uh, raison d'etre ever since. You know, if something sounds exciting, it probably is. And you should at least explore it. <laughs> Yeah, I feel like that's a good recipe for success in, in any sort of professional field that's really competitive is grabbing those opportunities as they come and trying to engineer it from the beginning is, I, I was never good at that either. Um, yeah, yeah. All right, well, let's get into microbiomes then. So from your perspective, uh, what, what, what is a microbiome and, and why do you think it's important? Uh, well, what is a microbiome? Well, microbiome is what we used to call microbial ecology, and which essentially it still is. It's just um, an ecosystem of microbes, right? Anything that's uh, small. Um, and that could be eukaryotes, protists, little fungi, anything that's single cellular normally, and viruses, bacteria, archaea, the, the whole gamut. And, and to, to me, um, I like to think of it as a, a living, breathing unit of life, right? Um, and, and you find it everywhere. And that's the beautiful thing about life is it finds a way, as Michael Crichton said. You know, um, it, it's, th these, are, these are organisms that have been around for three and a half to four billion years. And, and they've colonized, you know, every facet of this world in, in unique ways. And 
you know, the, the field of the human microbiome really has only come along in the last, you know, 20 years. And, uh, but uh, we're just another lump of flesh that microbes have colonized. Uh, and, and we've had to adapt our entire bodies, our entire body plan, um, our, you know, our immune system is all just adaptations to dealing with living in a microbial world being exposed to microbes all the time and when you when you see it from that perspective it really does change your understanding of the world we live in everything from you know the pioneering work by margaret mcfall nye and ned ruby on on the uh, on vibrio relationships with cephalopods all the way through to um you know trying to understand what really drives uh, plant adaptations as you and i have done in the past right with your work uh, up in montana um, in, in different environments and, and seeing how they actually function. Once you realize that everything that we can see with our eyes is just trying to survive in a microbial world and take advantage of microbes where they can and steer away from them where they, where they can't, um, you really, it really changes your perspective on, uh, on the biology of our planet. And so for me, that's always been a driving force to really try and see the world from a microbial perspective and understand what it means to swim in that soup. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, I feel like all of sort of 19th and 20th century microbiology was about about the bad guys, right? Studying the right. pathogens. And and so microbes, bugs, people had like a, a negative connotation with them. But I, I feel like the, the microbiome field is, has been a, a, a paradigm shift in, in how we think about it. Because they're not all bad guys, right? Yeah, well, I mean, you know, it's funny, even you go back into the late 19th century, it's not like everybody always thought they were all bad guys. I mean, even Louis Pasteur said that he didn't believe that certain animals or plants would be able to survive without microbes, right? So people knew it. People instinctively knew that there was, there were, you know, this, th these things were living organisms with their own uh, game plan, but um, their adaptations were manifold. It wasn't like, you know, it's not even like right now, if you take Yersinia pestis, it's not like Yersinia pestis' entire game plan is to infect people and kill them with bubonic plague, right? Um, there is a, there are other facets to its character. I like to say this, it's not like every, everybody that goes to jail is a criminal, right? You know, uh, there are just people who got into the wrong circumstances and, you know, due to the mind numbing and, and degrading poverty that uh, many Americans have to live with. Uh, you know, got into the wrong situation and, and had to take advantage of that situation when it happened. Bacteria are the same. You can demonize them all you want, but to be perfectly honest, they're just trying to survive in their world as well, right? You know, right. Their freedom. <laughs> and if your survival helps them, then they're going to help you, right? It's, it's, you know, they're not necessarily good yeah. guys, not necessarily bad guys. Context is key. Context uh, guess, is everything. Yeah. And this leads me to the next question, because I know you've published a paper on this very topic, but how would the world be different if all the microbes just disappeared overnight? Yeah, so this was Josh Newfeld's idea. I think we were having a beer in some place in Colorado, and he said, "He said I think this would be a good idea." So we we uh, yeah we just sat down and postulated, you know, uh, how important are microorganisms on the planet? And uh, and you know, it turns out when you do the thought experiment, they're pretty important, right? But, you know, like, what do you call a microbe? If you take away all the mitochondria. And the chloroplasts, which are ancient microbes from our bodies, then, you know, everything drops dead instantly, right? But if you, if you, um, you know, if you look at, say, uh, you know, bacterial nitrogen fixation, you know, it's, it, 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 there are maybe a couple of new reports of, of some eukaryotes that have evolved certain mechanisms that are akin to nitrogen fixation. But aside from that, 90, 99% of all the nitrogen on the planet that's not fixed by human processes is fixed by bacteria. Imagine taking that away. What happens to all the plant life on planet Earth if suddenly you start to run out of the available nitrogen stocks? You need nitrogen for for all of our processes, for all of our proteins, all of our you know uh, DNA. <laughs> it's kind of written there in the code, right? It, nitrogen is important, and that's just one facet. They are central to everything on planet Earth because they were here first. I mean, they they're the one that made this planet oxygenic right yeah. pumping in tons of oxygen every other breath you breathe comes from microorganisms pumping out oxygen from the ocean right this and is a breath comes from chloroplasts that are ancient microbes <laughs> enslaved by plants. i like that yeah 
<laughs> That's a good one. I should, I get it. I'm going to steal that. I'm going to use that. Right. It's really all microbes. All these little fleshy things walking around thinking they're all that. It's um, it's it's kind of nonsense. Yeah, I, but I do love that idea, right? I love doing thought experiments. And again, harking back to science, that's what science is. Sit down and think out the problem. Work work it through. If you if you can do that, and especially if you have really, you know, engaged people to work with, right? Like uh, you and I used to sit down and do this, and I and I still do this all the time. I try and sit down and go, okay, what is the actual problem? Let's work it. Let's work it through. Figure out these experiments. Try and try and think about what the experiment's going to tell us. Try and think about what other experiments we should be running. And, and realistically, what's the end goal? You know, why are we doing why are we doing this science? And so those thought experiments become incredibly important in helping to shape what you think uh, you can do, what you can apply uh, yourself to in order to find the next discoveries that are incredibly important. Yeah. And I'm sure these thought experiments um, drove you to some of your, your bigger projects, right? So let's talk about the Earth Microbiome Project. How did that emerge and how did that start and what was the impetus for it? Yeah. Um, I mean, we've done, we done this large scale study in the United Kingdom um, uh, looking inspired by Jed Furman's work from University of Southern California and Jen Martini's work. Uh, uh, she, uh, well, she's now at University of Irvine, uh, UC Irvine. Um, that, that were exploring how microorganisms fluctuated over time and space. And I'm still obsessed with this, right? You know, what is it about niche space? The, the n-dimensional hypervolume, I love that term, of, of, of environmental parameters that shape when and why a microorganism can grow and breathe and live, right? And, and that to me has always been fascinating. So understanding how things change through time became incredibly important to me. And I quickly realized I was unable or it, it, was, it was impossible to study microorganisms in the context we wanted to study them in, um, in, in, uh, in one environment, let alone trying to see if patterns that we observed in one place were propagated around the world, right? I always wanted to find that universal rule, like the thing which drives everything. And in the English Channel, it looked like microbial life was driven by the amount of daylight that was available, not, not, not due to cloud cover or, or like sun intensity, just the length of the day, you know, it's, you know, it gets dark out here now because the, you know, the sun was not hitting San Diego as much as it was in the summer, right? And that's, that length of day seems to be a vital clue to what drives the energetics of ecosystems. So I, I wanted to see if that was propagated around the world. And so we got the great and the good, right? We got, we got Rob Knight, who had already been exploring tons of microbiomes around the world and was, you know, already set up to try and explore this and um and a bunch of other scientists ashley shade who is a phenomenal um currently a phenomenal assistant professor in msu and doing some incredibly important work and we got them all in a room and we said all right just do a thought experiment you know uh if you had unlimited budgets uh what, what would you do to try and catalog microbial diversity on earth and find these patterns what would be the driving force behind that well, i mean why would you do it uh, you know, how would you do it? And, and realistically, uh, what would what are the gaps? What are our things that we need to overcome in order to actually achieve it? And, and, and out of that came, you know, what became the Earth Microbiome Project. We got a very talented graphic designer called um, Eamon, Eamon McGuire, who was already working for us in the Genomic Standards Consortium to do a freebie and come up with a logo. Once you've got a logo, you've got everything, right? Then it all just, you know, carries on from there. And, uh, you know, I sank all of my startup capital um, from my, uh, you know, I moved to University of Chicago and Argonne National Lab and all my startup went into actually running that project. And, you know, Rob put a ton of his money in and Janet Jansen put a ton of her money in and we all kind of tried to see if we could collaborate with scientists around the world to get a load of samples in and just start sequencing. And that's all it was, right? And you ended up with, you know, uh, well over 500 collaborators Everybody put their two pennies in. Everyone had their own little research project they wanted sequencing for. And we just enabled that, uh, developed a whole ton of kick-ass you know, programs and tools and, and protocols, which are now industry standard, right? The protocols the Earth Microbiome Project developed are what everybody mostly uses. Um, and, and it enabled us to create this one giant database, which sounds lame, right? Who wants a big giant database? But with giant databases, you can ask, really important questions and um, I mean, we're still answering 
asking and answering those questions to this day. It, it's it's never really ended. It's just continually trundling along like some kind of out of control train. <laughs> I mean, I remember being struck as a student by the audacity of the project, right? We're going to se sequence the microbiome of the earth, yeah. of everything <laughs> on earth. You know, the human microbiome project was just like 300 people, but you were going to like do so everything. Boring. Yeah. <laughs> well, three, yeah, those 300 people had a lot more money, um, you know, like spent on them than we had to spend on the planet. But I think that, you know, when, when you're scrappy and you're, you're, you know, you're, you don't get all the money in the world, you, you, you figure out ways to do things that, um, that change the world. Right. I honestly believe that still. I, I think some of the some of the projects where we're most innovative are the ones that are not funded, <laughs> you know, because we have to like scrimp and scrape, you know, save every corner and and come up with innovations that will actually help us to get that project done. Um, when when someone drops a ton of money on us, oftentimes it causes more problems. I'm not saying that out loud, am I? Oh Christ, someone's going to have a go at me, like the NIH is going to come after me for their money back. But um, you know, I think it's I think it's important that you you realise right that um when when you when you have a vision you find the people that you can work with to make that vision possible and the people that share the passion right it's not always the people that are best at it it's the people that share the passion and if you all share the same passion man then you can do anything you know you can change the world and in, 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 in change the ecosystem entirely and i really honestly do believe that's what the earth microbiome project did it laid a foundation to set up what what has become um, a, a field which has, you know, changed the world. Um, you know, and that, that may be hyperbolic. Like a, do you have like a, a favorite uh, biological insight or two that has come out of that work? Is there something well, that you think is? I mean, the thing, the thing I think is uh, the, you know, and I, I think you know that I, you know, this your your PNES paper from uh, 2012, I think, was a fundamental start of this. But my obsession with the fact that everything has the ability to be everywhere. Right, distribution of microbial life is is constant, and the you know what the Earth Microbiome Project proved is that that is um, almost a reality. Right, if you look in any environment on Earth, you find the same phylogenetic backbone of microbial life uh, being generated and then selected for by very selective environments. You know, you take a hydrothermal vent, you know, you've got you know 120 degrees centigrade water spewing out of the ground, you know, 4,000 meters under the ocean in the pitch darkness covered in sulfur. Um, and yet, you know, these things are ephemeral. They just pop up out of nowhere. And suddenly all the microorganisms that are super adapted to that environment appear. Yeah, right. You know, uh, Judy Huber, a phenomenal microbiome scientist and uh, working at uh, Woods Hole Oceanographic Institute, has, uh, you know, has done some really cool work looking at how these bacteria come out of the fluids in the earth. But they're also coming out of the ocean themselves. And we find them everywhere. Right, we find them distributed around the world, just incredibly low abundances, and that to me is the most exciting thing. You know, the fact that the microbes in my body came from somewhere; they didn't just sporadically appear. They are colonizing me, and a lot of them are passed down. Um, uh, you know, from person to person. We just had a paper published with Rand Blackman and uh, and um, and a lot of other collaborators. I oh, got um, uh, Beth Archie. Um, and oh, everyone, a phenomenal, phenomenal group of scientists. I'm just so lucky to be in, uh, even associated with them. But, you know, showing that baboons share this rich, diverse microbial flora within their tribe, you know, within their um, pack. I can't, can't remember what the collective noun for baboons is. But um, and that, you know, they that 90 percent plus of that microbial community is heritable. Right. It, it shares genetic. Well, it, it shares the same uh, trend for kinship. Um, as that population does, and that that's phenomenal, right? It says that you know there is there is sharing within that population, but those microorganisms are also coming into that population and adapting through it. And I think that's beautiful. Yeah, and it takes us to um, so you know, you've you done a lot of work in the built environment. Speaking yeah. of baboons being colonized by their by their neighbors and by their environment, you know they're out they're out in the in the wild and in the forest or in the plains. Human beings are in a very different environment. Um, so. Can you talk a little bit about how you think the built environment has affected the human microbiome? Yeah, it's a, this is a difficult one, right? Um, I, you know, the way I would have talked about this 10 years ago is probably very different to the way I talk about it now. In fact, when, when 
you know, a program officer invited me to get involved with it at the behest of Volker Meyer, who was one of my colleagues at Argonne National Lab. I honestly thought it was kind of nonsense, right? You know, uh, there's not a hell of a lot of microbial diversity in this. And, uh, but, you know, uh, you know, we, we got some money and if someone gives me some money, I'll do something with it, right? So we had a look-see and it actually turned out to be some pretty interesting trends. I could do some cool ecology in an environment where there's very little life. And yeah, and I know your your side of it, the whole thing's a desert and everything's dead, right? Yeah, but even deserts are ecosystems. Oh, I know, I, I totally, I mean, I, I do think that things are like dead and dying on a lot of these surfaces, but but they are, they're also reservoirs. And, and, and yeah. in, the, in a sense, the fact that they're dead surfaces is very different from if you're in a forest living your life, right? So that, that's, right. you know, the, 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 the potential for us to be colonized by diversity is perhaps dampened and yeah, and you know, and, but remember, we're not always being colonized. I think you know the 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 major impact to answer your first question and to spin off of that that I think we're feeling is a lack of antigenic exposure, right? Um, you know, we our our bodies are used to being constantly bombarded with antigens, and you know, and um, you know, work we did with Carol Ober and Anne Sperling and Donata Bocelli and other colleagues at Chicago and Arizona on the Amish and Hutterites really demonstrated that, right? When kids grow up in a farm and they actually have the opportunity to live and work on the farm, you can see the signature of that in their immune systems. Their, their immune profile is reflective of being constantly bombarded by things, by antigens, by bacteria and viruses and fungi and dirt, right? Um, and, and that to me is, is a key precept that our bodies are expecting to see that that kind of stuff right and you know, it spins off of you know the hygiene hypothesis and the old friends hypothesis the fact that uh you know in in history are uh, we we descend from people who would have been exposed to lots of things and the fact that we're not exposed to them but now uh is making our immune systems dysfunctional like they they can't quite figure out how to uh, respond properly to uh the antigens when they do appear and i think that's I think that's a, a key precept of what's missing from most of our built environments, right? When kids have a dog in the home that they can physically interact with, they have a 13% reduction in likelihood of developing asthma. I mean, this is, these, you know, these epidemiological studies demonstrate there's an importance to that exposure. And so, you know, from my perspective, I've always been about, well, I want to figure out um, the bi-directional mode of interaction between us and that environment. And that's actually led me down some really weird paths, right? You know, now we, are actually adding bacteria back into hospitals. We're adding bacteria um, uh, into our homes in order to see if we can not just stimulate immune responses. We're not there yet, although there's some really, really cool work coming out with some collaborators in Finland soon that uh, is, is exploring that phenomenon. But um, we actually think that uh, having bacteria in the building can actually reduce the spread of disease. Uh, a lot of this comes from the fact that when the bacteria leave our moist, warm, cozy body and end up on these cold, harsh, dry, desert-like surfaces, right? They most of them die, as you pointed out. But the ones that survive are like Mad Max hardcore survivors, right? They 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 hang around and they often have these adapted genes which make them dangerous to humans. More virulence, more antibiotic resistance. But not if you chuck a load of bugs in there that stop them from growing. And that's what I think is so cool, right? Yeah. You, you give them a forest. You can't throw a house plant into a you know a rainforest and expect it to grow. These bugs that leave us, they're not. They're they're only surviving there because there's nothing there to outcompete them. So we're giving them competition, and yeah. I think that will be the frontier for changing built environment microbiology for good. Pollution is the solution to pollution. All righty. <laughs> uh, this, is, this is like a, um, a hospital probiotic. You, you guys are working on to try to yeah anti antimicrobial anti resistance and um, yeah well you know uh, again a brilliant group of people We're actually uh, Megan Thuemis Timis Megan Timis um, who's one of our postdocs uh, she's working on this in hospitals um, in the San Diego County area who I won't name but also um, working on a similar program with NASA and actually one Megan MacArthur who's an astronaut from NASA and also a Scripps Institution of Oceanography alum. Uh, has been doing the sampling for our research projects on the International Space Station, exploring these types of phenomena, which I think is so cool. You know, it's all connected. <laughs> oh, it's super cool. Uh, and and I guess that also, let's see, I'll, I'll try to scale back some of my questions. We're, we're getting close to audience questions, but I have, I have a few more I want to 
get to. I did say, you, you get me talking, you can't yeah, stop yeah. me from talking. <laughs> <laughs> this is the time flies when you're having fun. Um, well, I guess, you know, we sort of covered all this, but, you know, you wrote, you wrote this popular science book with Rob Knight, right, called Dirt is Good. And, and I and just maybe briefly. I didn't name it. it. Yeah. That wasn't, that wasn't our title. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's the, again, it's the precept that being exposed to things is important. What, uh, Rob and I are both new parents at the time, right? And uh, in fact, our children are born on the same day, which is kind of weird. I know, you know we've always been intrinsically strangely linked. But, um, uh, you know, in the context of this, we just wanted to provide a right kind of advice, right? There's a lot of nonsense out there um, and you can get any kind of advice you want on the internet. So we just wanted to like take all the knowledge that we had and our collaborators had and just put it in a way that could actually be translated. We found this wonderful writer called Sandra Blakesley who helped to translate some of our sciences into uh, less less dense language. But um, I'm, I'm proud of that book because the, the way we were able to present it is still accurate, right? There's nothing in there which is hyperbolic. There's nothing in there which is inaccurate. There are accurate statements, and I like accurate statements. It means that you can, uh, you know, you can trust the information in, in, in the book too, if you're interested in raising children, you know, it's a cool thing to do. Yeah, it's 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 just an interest. Hygiene hypothesis in general is an interesting area. You know, we definitely have seen improvements in human life from hygiene, right? Like, you know, infectious diseases. Enormous, enormous ones. You know, yeah, vaccines, but, hygiene, they're important. You know, but there's a huge cost as well that we didn't recognize, which is this disruption to our immune systems and the rise of these inflammatory conditions and the sort of developed world syndromes that that we suffer from now. So, how do you strike that right balance? And I, yeah, I think that book kind of kind of gets into that. Um, I, I couldn't resist. You, we were talking about some of the ongoing projects that you have in, in the lab, and I, I heard about dolphin FMTs, fecal transplants for inflammatory bowel disease. Dol dolphin inflammatory bowel disease. Yeah, man, they get to eat some bad stuff when they're out there in the ocean. So these these are dolphins that are wild dolphins, that, um, domesticated wild dolphins. They live out in the wild, but they, you know, they're um, they are uh, friendly to their their um, handlers. We'll put it leave it at that. And yeah, and some of them, some of them get um, severe IBS and IBD. And so we're interested in exploring how to manage their colitis symptoms when they do get it. And so uh, we, we've been doing fecal microbiome transplants from healthy dolphins to non-healthy dolphins and see if we can alleviate the symptoms. And it appears to work quite well. Cool. You know, and if you think about it, a dolphin's just, you know, a, a very friendly and very much cleverer sea dog. So, you know, there's no, there's, it's, it, they're just um, a, a wonderful, wonderful animals to work with you know they have personalities all their own yeah <laughs> that's awesome and i guess before we run into the the other questions I'll, I'll just kind of leave off on my questions with um you know when do you think everyday people out there listening in the audience for example are going to start to see the impacts of the human microbiome field in their in their daily lives when are they going to have access to this this sort of research and in, in clinical medicine and all these other things yeah, I, you, know, they, you know, other than FMT, fecal microbiome transplant for treating uh, recurrent C. diff, there are no FDA approved therapies. There's a there's one that's extremely close um, uh, with Series Health. Uh, that's another, um, you know, targeted therapeutic for treating C. diff seal infections. So everything is C. diff, C. diff, C. diff, C. diff. And yet, you know, uh, the, the public can access them. And, I, you know, I'm on the scientific advisory board for day two, for example, I have to announce that. Um, and, you know, and I, I, this is work that came out of the Wiseman Institute with Iran and Iran Segal. Um, and Iran Segal is an you know, incredible scientist and, uh, and a bioinformatician who's generated algorithms that uh, ca capture a lot of information and hunt down traits that can be used to predict how to drag people out of prediabetes into diabetes. And, you know, and I, I begged, borrowed and stole my way into that company. And, uh, and my dad used the company to bring himself out of a prediabetic state. So he, he managed uh -huh. to stave off type two diabetes and is now much healthier than he was. Um, and because the, the algorithm predicts um, a diet, right? That is personalized effectively diet. personalized for him. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. The main to control his glycemic responses to food. Um, so I would say it's out there. There's a lot of faff and nonsense as well, as well. like it's a capitalist society. You know, there's always gonna be someone trying to take advantage of you. But for the most part, there are there are companies out there doing incredibly exciting science that is is changing the world. 
Um, it takes a long time to get things into the clinical sector. But even without that, I would argue that there are very few people out there who are interested in their gut, interested in their diet that haven't heard about the microbiome. So from a zeitgeist perspective, you know, a paradigm shift, as Kuhn would have said, uh, we're dealing with something where the society now accepts the fact that they're not just feeding themselves, they're feeding bacteria in their intestine. And if you do that, it has a role. So while we wait for clinical science to catch up, which can take decades, right? Um, I think we're at a space where people are accepting that there are um, information they can use that could be beneficial in helping them to live a healthier life, right? Eat more fiber, eat the rainbow. And now we know why it's important. Right. Yeah, I mean, I think it's just such an exciting time right now with the the pace of, of translational research that's coming out in the literature. I feel like we're on the cusp of a lot of stuff happening really fast. Um, I know, I've been saying that for 10 years, though, you know, like, yeah. uh, <laughs> but like, it's happening, right? Like day two is happening. They just, I just saw they had a study out where they, they proved that their personalized diet was a, was actually better at reducing, um, you know, insulin levels compared to a Mediterranean diet, which is sort of the standard of care of like a good yeah. diet. So it, it's happening. It's happening. Yeah. You know, it's, it's funny how people, uh, you know, one, the one, the one solution fits all is great for the average. Um, unfortunately, the funny thing about an average is there's a lot of people above it and below it. Um, and, you know, and it's, it's those people that miss out. And so in, with all of these things, if the microbiome can do anything, it can help stratify patient populations and participants into groups that we can then use to target more um, effective and personalized therapies. Great. Okay. Well, now we will get to our lovely audience's questions. Um, so first off, I see we have a question about the American Gut Project. And essentially, it's similar to what I asked about the, the Earth Microbiome Project. What is your, what is your biggest takeaway from that project? Uh, yes, uh, you know, uh, this is so uh, formulated by Rob Knight in 2011, launched in 2012 um, uh, with my help and a, a bunch of other people. Um, and it's still trundling along. We're about to relaunch um, uh, the American Gut Project next year. And we are, uh, because we wanted to take all the information, all the knowledge that we've gained from the 30 or 40,000 people that have already donated to the project, right? People donate to the project and uh, they have the microbiome sequence so that the microbiome information can go into a glorious free database, which um, we can use then to identify how the microbiome associates with traits in large populations. And in fact, many of the, uh, many of the clinical companies out there utilize the American Gut Project to help understand how their therapies might work. So um, my biggest takeaway from it is that uh, crowdsourcing science can be successful. <laughs> the biggest scientific takeaway from it is that if you eat more than 30 species of plant a week, you'll have a, a very diverse microbiome and metabolome, the chemicals released by those bacteria. Um, and I've taken that to heart, right? A little bit of fermented food and a lot of fiber uh, and diversity of food, right? Um, you know, uh, but, but eat as many different things as you can and don't try and eat the same thing all the time, you know? Um, and uh, that has the biggest impact for health. Yep, yep. And, and one of the big takeaways for me for both the Earth Microbiome Project and American Gut is just the huge value in, in making data free to everybody, whether it's industry and science. And you know, I know my lab has used those data sets over and over again as, as sort of comparison cohorts or validation cohorts. So it just, it just sort of um, accelerates science, generally speaking, to have oh. those kinds of big data sets. You know, that's exactly what we wanted it to be, right? It was, an, it was a way of taking our little data sets and comparing them to something big so we can see that we found this bacteria it's associated with, you know, eye allergies or whatever. Um, is it really, how, how is this thing distributed in the population at large? It's just an unfortunate, you know, we've been trying to fill the gaps to make it more equitable and socially responsible and socially, you know, representative. And that's hard, man, that's hard because there are a lot of people out there that we want to capture who don't have the money to donate to science. So we rely on other people to donate for them. So if that's something you're interested in, you want to get you know, a more diverse representational cohort, find people who'd be willing to donate to support other people getting involved, right? Yep, great point. Next question from the audience is, uh, what do you think is one of the biggest misconceptions about the human microbiome? But diversity is really important. Right. Uh, I, 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 I know I've been pushing this for a while, 
um, you know, some types of diversity, a highly diverse microbiome can be one that's unstable. And I know you've been interested in that, that idea for a long time. Um, uh, you know, and, 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 and an unstable microbiome may not be one that's helping you. Uh, you know, uh, a, a low diversity microbiome is often one that's either bad or good. But bad or good is binary, right? We can you you can have a good microbiome that's low diversity, and you can have a bad microbiome that's low diversity. I think I think the key concept comes from a highly diverse microbiome is probably more robust to change, right? And th therefore, if it's highly diverse in a healthy state, that's a good thing. But you know, there's it's just relying on diversity as a measure of benefit or health. I think is one of the most annoying and 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 almost hypocritical scientific failures right it's it's too simple and uh, yep. you know a lot of that stems from doctors wanting really really simple metrics they can use to understand what the hell's going on because when you're used to you know the chemical in the blood is x or you know your h1 bca2 score whatever is y you know you, that's easy to understand the microbiome is not easy to understand it's incredibly complicated and even the ecologists studying it are really only starting to get to grips with it in in uh, in the last few years yeah no I, I couldn't agree more with with those points i mean we had a paper a year or two ago tom olmansky was the first author on it where we observed that um people who were constipated had really high alpha diversity yeah and it's right good constipated uh, i don't know probably not um i remember i stood up at a conference like year or two two years ago right before the pandemic and i said that essentially that well it's context dependent maybe it's good maybe it's bad depends on the context and it was like i farted like everyone yeah me. yeah yeah they look at you they look at you like well that doesn't help me i mean the, the person i think is doing uh the, some of the most interesting work in this space at the moment is mariana bindloss um she's a phenomenal professor and and her work is really trying to pinpoint exactly what we mean by dysbiotic Right. When someone says you have dysbiosis, what do you mean? Well, it doesn't mean you have low diversity. That's bullshit. Right. Pardon my French um, <laughs> or, or English. Um, you know, it's it's actually completely related to um, very, very specific breakdowns in the communication, chemical communication between the bacteria and the body. And she's uncovering those and making them available and translatable for doctors. Right. And that's that's where we should be doing, working at really getting down to the mechanistic brass tacks of what we mean by these statements. Yeah. yeah. Uh, next question from the audience um, kind of goes towards translation. Um, what types of microbiome products or technologies can we expect in the coming years? Things that we don't see yet, but we might see in like the next couple of years. Well, a few things I'm super interested in. Uh, some of the work coming out of David Mills lab um, up at UC Davis, um, um, and spun out into a number of companies, but uh, dealing with the fact that adding certain types of bacteria into the guts of infants that are breastfeeding can have a f massive impact upon their immune training. So Bifidobacterium longum infantis as a probiotic therapy for improving childhood um, immune health. I think that's a really low hanging fruit option, but it's a phenomenally powerful option for changing the face of um, chronic allergic disease in our country. I'm super excited about the, the field of um, psychobiotics, as uh, John Cryan would call them, um, uh, using bacterial probiotics that produce neurotransmitters to have an impact upon mental health. And we actually formed a company, and I do have stocks and shares in that company, uh, called um, uh, Holobiome that is trying to commercialize those kinds of products. So I'm very excited about that work. Um, and I got a really, really cool new um, a graduate student called uh, Marisol Bothard, who's um, doing uh, spearheading that work in our labs at the moment and, and doing some phenomenal work with uh, rats and uh, depression anxiety. So I'm really excited about that stuff. I think, I think you know, there's, there's also um, some incredibly exciting stuff coming out on trying to understand uh, diet and immune health more generally as we age. Right, the implications for what it means to maintain a healthy gut, to maintain a healthy body, to prolong uh, um, a healthy longevity. Right, and you know I'm not there yet, hopefully, but um, I'm uh, you know I can definitely feel my 40 year old bones getting achy. So I'm hoping that we can get that sorted before I uh, before I hit 70. You know? Nice, and I you know I know I also happen to know you are a co-founder co or a founder of Biome Sense, right? But that's I guess that's oh, more yeah, targeting yeah. research, right? Not, not necessarily consumers, but 
Yeah, well, it will be consumers at some point. Oh, so this okay. is a magical, this is like a, 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 an automated s um, stool sampler, right? So you stick it in your bathroom, drop a piece of toilet tissue in the top, and it extracts all the DNA and RNA and nucleic acids. And so every stool sample we can capture, right? Every single time you do it. And your work, this is inspired by your work, which I, you know, you and Eric, and um, uh, demonstrating that we need, we can't just take one sample and, and compare it to a population and expect to find a marker. That marker of a disease may be present in your poop one day and disappear the next. And if we pick the wrong day, then you don't show up in our, in our um, you know, personal assessment of whether you have that marker. That's super important to us. So yeah, it is based on research now, but we hope that that product can be incredibly powerful for helping to stratify patient populations to improve um, the outcomes of therapies. You know, bi billions, tens of billions of dollars are wasted on clinical trials every year because we can't get the stra patient stratification right to determine if those drugs are effective. Those drugs probably are effective for a section of people, right? But we can't figure out which people to test. I think the microbiome holds that information, but I think we need to use longitudinal characterization to understand the dynamics to figure out which people would be responders and non-responders. Once we have that information, you can design clinical trials and that will accelerate drug development um, and save money. <laughs> yeah, no, we, we've been arguing for a few years here at ISB that you should design clinical trials with maybe smaller numbers of people, but with much denser data longitudinally collected. So that if the trial fails, at least you have something to go back to and, and be like, oh, well, actually the drug worked in these 20 people but it didn't work at all in these other 30 people. It's just that it was very heterogeneous. And But you could yeah. see that when you have the data to look at it. But other, if you're just doing a, a simple clinical trial or you're only measuring a couple of things, you you totally miss it. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, it's um, you know, it's, it's, it's one of those things where you're hitting your head against a brick wall of, um, of a lot of gray beards who um, have been doing this their entire lives and this is the way it's done. And you when you try and tell them it's you're doing it wrong, um, generally, they don't respond very well, um, but they are, <laughs> and that's what's annoying. Jack, we're just too innovative. That's what I keep we telling are. myself. We're so young. We're so young and hip. <laughs> so uh, another question from the audience. Uh, you mentioned your kids. Uh, how has your knowledge, for example, Dirt is Good, affected your parenting style? What advice would you give to new parents? Yeah, we, um, you know, I'm, I know I've got, I've got colleagues who have written very similar books uh, and, uh, who are uh, really really strict with their kids diet i'm not you know my kids it's it's my youngest son's birthday and i i he had pot stickers that was what he wanted that's what he got right uh and if he wants mac and cheese i'll give him mac and cheese as well but what i what i try and instill in them is the fundamental understanding right and showing them that they can eat healthy so yeah we eat a lot of diverse fruits and vegetables on a regular basis it's always there it's always available and that that you know that's our privilege in being you know uh, in, a, uh, in a wealthy uh, position in this world, there are lots of people who don't have access to that kind of dietary thing and children grow up without access to the food due to food deserts. And, you know, when you're, when your local, uh, you know, when your local grocery stores are 7-Eleven, you're, you know, you're, you're going to suffer some major problems. But I think, yeah, teaching them about how to live a healthy diet has been key. You know, also my eldest son has autism, right? And so we, we played a hell of a lot of role in trying to understand how to regulate um, the side effects of um, his neurodiversity, which he doesn't like. You know, there's bits about being autistic which aren't particularly pleasant sometimes. And so managing those aspects for him has been um, has been something we, you know, played around with a, a lot. And a lot of that's just diet again. You know, making sure that he has the right kinds of foods, making sure we find which foods make him feel good and which ones make him feel bad and avoiding the bad ones, right? And then, you know, and working out solutions that are, you know, peer reviewed and uh, been uh, gone through the appropriate clinical trials and, and, and seeing if he wants to try them. Those kinds of uh, strategies, I think, have uh, played out, you know, in, in, in our, my parenting style in, in significant ways. Interesting. Yeah, I've, that, that last piece of, of sort of experimenting with foods one at a time and seeing what works. I know a lot of people out there tell me that this is what they do themselves. If they, you know, a lot of people have sour guts and issues with their guts, and it's hard to the docs don't know what to do, and so they. My mother has done this in her, herself of, of kind of experimenting with what what seems to be working, what doesn't work. It takes a long time for people to figure it out, but but oftentimes people do come to understand like what foods 
tend to be good for them and what aren't. And I think right. science needs to catch up to these end of one type trials. I mean, yeah. there are there are designs like make crossover trial designs where you can you can look across a population with these sort of personalized interventions um, and use this person as their own control. But I, I think that just not enough people are doing it, uh, maybe because the gray beards are are preventing these kind of trials. Yeah, from definitely the gray beards. We'll blame it on them. I mean, it's also it's just because there's so many variables, right, to yeah. try and it can be overwhelming, right? It, you know, if you're lactose intolerant, you're probably missing Blauschia, a, a particular type of bacteria that has, you know, lactase and can degrade lactose, right? So, you know, uh, if if you're missing Blauschia from your gut, uh, Rosabalis uh, or Rosaburia as well, you're you're very unlikely to be, uh, to have a good response to certain types of uh, dairy products. Understanding that's kind of key, right? And you can figure it out from looking at the microbiome now. But for years, people just had to suck it and see, you know, oh God, every time I had that milkshake, it made me feel bad. And and that's that's where we're at with about 90% of, of all the problems. Um, but it's, you know, it's compelling. You know, there's a, another company, I'm on their scientific advisory board and they, they're just about to publish a paper where they demonstrated that you can accurately predict what type of IBS you have based upon the microbiome from a, a study of over 400, 500 people, right? So it's, we're getting there. You would get, we, you know, if you know what type of IBS you have, it's possible that you can get targeted treatment to actually help to alleviate the symptoms. Um, and that, so those things are coming down the pipeline. Cool. Well, this, the time has really flown by here. I think, I think we're getting close to the top of the hour. We have time for one more audience question, I, I think, before we wrap up. So I'll, I'll, I'll choose this one. Um, what do you think about fecal transplants for conditions other than recurrent C. diff, right? There's a lot of trials going on that have been done that are ongoing. Um, do you see potential there? And, and, and also comparing that to like bugs as drugs companies that are trying to create cocktails or individual bugs to treat these yeah. different diseases. Yeah, I think there's a lot of potential, right? Um, and it's just going to take a while for the investment firms to fund the trials to actually get this stuff done. You know, I've seen some really compelling uh, preliminary phase one and phase two AB. These are yeah, FDA um, uh, level uh, trials um, that demonstrate quite effectively that you can use FMT and potentially bugs as drugs in, in small cocktails for, for improving outcomes in, in cancer therapy and oncology. Um, that you can, um, you know, some, some compelling but not particularly uh, rigorous data um, coming out of Arizona, Rosa Crouch, Malnick Brown stuff, demonstrating that you can alleviate some of these side effects of um, neurodiversity and autism, um, and that it could potentially be beneficial. There's some really compelling stuff around treating cardiac diseases, uh, metabolic disorders. Um, so these things are coming through, right? But we, you know, we need better data. We need more rigorous data. We need time series data, right? Um, damn the great bids. We, we got to get the right data to demonstrate for whom it works and for whom it doesn't work. And yeah. if we can, if we can have that data, these things could be incredibly powerful. Exactly. I mean, I think one of the, one of the keys to that, you know, it's hard to create one pill for, for everybody. And I, and that's just as true for a bug as it is for a drug. And for a lot of these interventions, there are going to be subsets of the population that just respond wonderfully to that intervention and other subsets that do not. And so being good at understanding the heterogeneity and, and, and being able to partition people in a personalized fashion to deploy these, these, um, these treatments is, I think that's the future, but it's going to take Agreed. some time to get there. And I'll make, I'll make a pitch, one last pitch, just to say um, we need more diversity in our cohorts. You know, uh, we, we're just about managed now to get 50% men, 50% women. We need more trans people embedded in our studies. We need more um, you know, ethnic diversity. Uh, we need more neurodiversity. We need to we need to embrace the fact that we're not all, um, apart from what this video shows, uh, you know, middle-aged white guys with long hair. Uh, there is a there is a, a world out there, and and it needs to be included in our clinical studies in order to demonstrate our support for everybody. Totally. All right. Well. On that note, uh, this has been a wonderful conversation, a wonderful evening. Thanks so much, Jack. Um, sure. I'm sure we could fill, we could easily fill another hour with with this conversation, but but we'll we'll call it at this. Um, I'd like to thank 
Seattle Town Hall for being such a great partner. Um, thanks to the audience for, for your attention. You can learn more about ISB um, at our website. Like I said, isbscience.org. Uh, don't forget about our reimagine event next week. Uh, it's an hour long virtual event that takes place on Wednesday, November 10th at 6 p.m. and focuses on the immune system. Um, you can register it again, isbscience.org. Um, and yeah, thanks so much again and, and have a really great evening. Thank you both so much for being here, Sean. Thank you for leading this conversation. And Jack, we couldn't be more grateful that you're here in Seattle with us, kind of virtually. So thank you for being here. <laughs> My pleasure. Thank you. Yes. And to our audience at home, thank you again and hope to see you soon. Everyone have a fantastic night. Thank you. <laughs>